This is a recording of an event held on January 27th, 2013. It is a panel of four speakers discussing what atheism, skepticism, and secular humanism are all about. The recording starts during an introduction of the first speaker, Sean Taylor. Thanks for listening. He is very involved in the secular uh, movement in, in Southern California. He is a uh, board member of the Humanist Fellowship of San Diego. He, is, uh, he was the mastermind for our Balboa Park outreach that we do every Saturday. Yeah, we, we, we do it every single Saturday. It's a lot of fun. Those of you that haven't been, you can come out and just hang out with us. It's just a nice day in the park. You don't have to talk to anybody that you don't know if you don't want to. If you want to talk to other people, we get a lot of people that come up and want to talk. So that's fun to do if you enjoy it. He's also uh, my co-host on our new podcast which we are calling Make a Believer Out of Me, or uh, more prosaically, Maboom. We have just done our first episode, and uh, that's online on YouTube on the Maboom Show channel. So if you want to look it up, check it out. So uh, he's, very, uh, he's very involved in every aspect that he can be in the secular movement. Uh, and the, I guess the worst thing that I can say about him is that he's a very good friend of mine. So, Sean Taylor. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to keep mine uh, really short here. I, I think what I'm talking about is... is pretty basic and easy. Uh, there's, there's not a whole lot to it, unfortunately. Um, e even though there, there seems to be a lot to it in society today, uh, especially in regards to the word atheism, um, as, as I'm sure many of us know and have seen the studies, uh, when it comes to trustworthiness, people usually will be more willing to trust their children with child molesters than they would an atheist. Um, however much sense that makes. But uh, there's, there's not a whole lot that, that goes on with atheism and agnosticism, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, and then I'm going to let everyone have a little more time. People often think that these are two different answers to the same question, uh, when in fact they're completely separate issues. Atheism has to do with belief. Agnosticism has to do with knowledge. Theism simply means that you believe in God or gods. You believe in a particular god, you are a theist. If you have no belief in any particular god, if you don't have any faith in any god or gods, you are an atheist. A is in without. That's all that A means is without. It doesn't mean that you eat babies or anything else. Just without. Without a belief in God. That's all there is to it. Agnosticism and Gnosticism, Gnosticism is a matter of knowledge. If you have absolute knowledge that there is a god or a higher intelligence or any other definition you want to give to it, then you are Gnostic about it. If you are agnostic about it, you have no proof, you think it is unknown or unknowable that there is, in fact, a god or gods or higher intelligence, power, whatever it may be, then you're agnostic about it. Most atheists, we find, are agnostic about it. They're not making any specific claim of knowledge. They are agnostic atheists. Um, Theists, as we find, are usually Gnostic about it. They, they are absolutely certain that there is a God, and they believe in him. They, they are Gnostic theists. Both words are really unnecessary, unfortunately. Um, we don't really use these words in, in anything else. Um, as, as I'm sure many of you know, when, when a matter of belief comes up with a believer, usually, if it does come out that you do not believe in any particular God, and you admit this, you say, no, I... I don't believe in God, I, I, I'm not a Christian, I don't believe in any God. They say, so what are you, like an atheist? Yeah, I mean, your vocabulary is incredible. I don't know why you, I don't know why you, this, we just don't do this with anything else, you know. Uh, yeah, it's the last, the second to the last door on the right. The penultimate door? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, <laughs> yeah, your, yes, your vocabulary is very impressive. I don't know why you, yes, yeah, this is, yeah, second to the last door. Yeah, I'm an atheist. I don't believe, that's all it means. That's all it means. And everyone is so afraid of that. Um, as Jim said, though, it is something that we need to take hold of. The only way to get rid of the extra baggage with that word is to use it. Um, I'm not recommending that anyone go lose family members or, or jobs by telling everyone you're an atheist. Um, but when it is appropriate, you know, when you are willing and able to tell someone that you do not believe, 
Use that word. Own it. I'm an atheist. Um, we, are taking a, we are taking a card from the LGBT community. We know how well it worked for them. Um, we are... We do have our troubles as non-believers. I'm not saying we're, uh, we have as many troubles equal to the LGBT community, obviously. But it is, it is an easy card that we can take from them. Um, they simply came out. When you found out that a good friend, a good person that you knew is a neighbor of yours, your, your favorite uncle, cousin, whatever, was in fact lesbian, gay, transgender, and that person still was that person, and it didn't change who they were, it made it more difficult to look at the word gay in such a negative light. The baggage with the word gay disappeared with that. And um, for most people and, and in, a, in a very large way. So that's, that's simply the only thing that we have to do with this word. I, I feel that our only goal as an atheist, if, if, if there's anything that goes along with being an atheist, is to just eliminate the necessity for our own existence. That's it. If we can get rid of all of the baggage with that word, it's a useless word. We, we don't have any word for people that don't believe in fairies. We don't have any word for, for any other silly belief. If you, if you believe that Elvis is actually dead, there's no special word for you. For those that, believe in, that don't believe in astrology, what, an adult? <laughs> so... Uh, so these A words, they're, they're dangerous and scary for many, um, there's, but they're very simple words. They're very useless words uh, in, in any real sense. And uh, the only way we can get rid of that is, is just by using them, um, not be afraid of them and understand what they really mean, and that make sure you inform others what they really mean and, more importantly, what they don't. And that, that's all for the A words. <clears throat> okay, um, and also I would just like to add to what Sean said that remember that when people talk about atheism, they often conflate that with a philosophy. Atheism is not a philosophy. It is a simple non-belief. So don't let people um, play that trick on you. Um, the next uh, speaker is going to talk about humanism. And um, I think she actually has two or three clones. I'm fairly certain that I can tell the difference between two of them. <laughs> and, the, and the reason is because I know she never sleeps. I know she works on these issues just about every minute of every day. She is the organizer. She's the glue that holds all the lo local groups together. She's the, the president and director of, of uh, the, the San Diego Corps, and she's the president of the Humanist Fellowship. She's also on the national board of the Humanist Association. Um, she never stops. She never will. God love her. <laughs> and, I, and I said that just to piss her off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Debbie Allen. Thank you. As Conway reminded me, if there is a God, I am screwed. I am so screwed. <laughs> anyway, I love the secular movement. Um, I love the people in it. They're some of the most thoughtful, interesting, educated people I know. And they're very opinionated. And that is what is difficult about this movement, too. They're very thoughtful and they're very opinionated. And we can go on for hours and hours about what this word means and what that word means and what we mean by it. But I think today what we're rallying around is we want to take back those words, like Jim said, and own them and properly define them for other people. Humanism has been around for thousands of years. I'd say any great philosophy, uh, any traditional societies, various religions have had humanistic ideals. Uh, there's a long, long history. Uh, you can go to the American Humanist website, which is AmericanHumanist.org. There's lots of essays. You can get a lot of history. So what I wanted to focus on today is secular humanism as opposed to religious humanism. Secular just ref refers to the fact 
that we reject all supernatural beliefs. We reject the idea that there are gods, spirits, deities, anything that transcends the natural world. It's a naturalistic viewpoint. Humanism has everything to do with what we value about each other, about human beings, about human nature. And it also has to do with being responsible and accountable. Since there are no gods or magic beings, it's up to us. We are responsible for the lies we, we create for ourselves. We are responsible for what happens to other people in our world. And we are responsible for the planet. The American Humanist Association tried to sum it up in three words, and they came up with good without gods. That's okay, but I would like us to move beyond even talking about what other people believe, meaning they're gods. We do want to be good without the threat of punishment or the promise of everlasting reward. Humanists take a very thoughtful approach, a very scientific approach, a very rational approach to deciding what our values are and what our ethics are. And that's something else that's very important to me about humanism. There is a blue sheet on your table, and I hope you take it with you. On one side is a statement of humanistic principles written by Paul Kurtz, and on the other is uh, the Humanist Manifesto 3. There's been three of them, Humanist Manifesto 1 from 1933, which borders on religious humanism. In fact, it was to some extent religious humanism. The next one, co-authored by Paul Kurtz, was one of the authors, Humanist Manifesto 2, took it definitely into the secular realm and then finally, I think it was so long, that Humanist Manifesto too, that they shortened it up, tried to give it some bullet points. And the bullet points in the Humanist Manifesto 3 are what humanists today basically agree on. So if you're wondering, wondering what a secular humanist believes, it's within the Humanist Manifesto 3. And then just because I have to do a little bit of selling, for the benefit of the community, we're looking forward to having a billboard launch next week. You may have heard of this, you may have not. If you haven't heard about it, it's because I don't have your email address. Meetup is all well and good, but I hate spamming through Meetup. So I have a separate email that goes out once, maybe twice a month, with news from the entire community, San Diego Coalition of Reasons. So make sure you give me your email address. If I already have it, no worries. You won't get extra email. It will just, I'll just be able to add you if I don't have you. Uh, the billboard should be posted next, uh, we hope by Wednesday next week on Highway 94 near College Avenue. You'll have to drive by it. It, it will advertise our community. It says, atheism, a personal relationship with reality. You can see a copy of the billboard by going to the San Diego Corps website. The address for that is on the little white business cards on the table. Uh, this will be followed up by a lecture with David Silverman from American Atheists at the end of February. And there's like little green pieces of paper on your table about that. Uh, finally, please get involved in the community. Find a group that you like and then support that group. Make sure they have money to have their meetup website, and make sure that you attend their events. Thank you. And you can bet that whatever um, group that you join, that you'll be seeing Debbie. There, there is no God that I believe in, but I do believe that Debbie is omnipresent. The next, uh, the next speaker is going to talk a little bit about skeptics and the skeptic movement and skepticism. Uh, he is uh, the organizer of the San Diego Skeptics Group and the San Diego Skeptics Meetup. 
uh, and he's very involved and very passionate about this uh, issue, uh, Nivik Storm. Thank you. So I want to talk about skepticism, as he mentioned, and what skeptical groups do. So everyone pretty much knows that being skeptical is about doubting, but no one wants to be a doubter, or especially known as a cynic. So I tend to think and identify myself more as a questioner, and it's, it's more about not taking things for granted. So I kind of want to recast doubting and skepticism in a more glamorous role for you all, because right now, in some circles, skepticism is kind of Slytherin and, and needs to be Gryffindor. <laughs> so what is skepticism? It is, it means you don't accept big things without big proof. It means that if someone tells you something, that the pathway into your brain, which goes to the library of things you believe, has to pay an entry fee in evidence. In other words, if you have no doubt, you are an easily programmed robot, and you're kind of at the will of around you in society. So regularly applied doubt is, is necessary or you're going to be the constant victim of scam artists and bogus cures and you're going to believe things that Sarah Palin says. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, number two, being a skeptic is a worldview. I think we are floating on top of a, a deep ocean of skepticism. Your entire worldview from its most fundamental parts is, is based on practiced doubt. Starting with matter itself, how would you arrive at the idea that we are mostly empty space? Until science came along to make careful and systematic observations, look for example at uh, Egyptian burial rituals which tried to carefully preserve your body for the afterlife. They ripped out your brain with a hook and then tossed it in the trash while preserving your liver. Common sense kind of tells, told them that they felt their emotions in their body. So that is where they thought the, the you was located. So if you try to put aside your modern mind for a minute and you, you realize that you have to be crazy to think that everything you are is all defined in a lump of spongy gray stuff. Um, take a look at bloodletting. Thousands of years it was practiced as a medical cure and it's, it's a powerful indictment to the common sense engine that the human brain defaults to. The double-blinded, placebo-controlled study, one of the keys to modern medicine, it flies in the face of personal experience. It is what the writer of the Skeptic's Dictionary calls an unnatural virtue. It doubts your personal experience and your personal observation. So Bill Nye, he said something like, science is the best way to find out what is true, and if it isn't, it will be science that finds out what is. The truth is, we have no hope of finding the truth if we already think we know the absolute truth. So skepticism is a positive worldview that is based on humility, questioning, and open-mindedness. You've got to be humble because the first rule of skepticism is to doubt your own beliefs. You've got to question because you must care about knowing the truth. And you've got to be open-minded because your mind must be open to look at the evidence and decide something only after having heard all the sides and then still stay open to new evidence. Um, I'll give you an example of that. My, uh, for years I've had allergies and I used to take this medicine and then the drug war happened and they regulated my, my drug, uh, my allergy medicine out of existence. So I went back to my doctor and, you know, said, you got to help me. And so he said, well, you know, you were taking an old school type of medicine and there's now a new, new stuff that's out in the marketplace. So go try all the, the over-the-counter allergy medicines. So I went out, I bought these various medicines and just had a horrible uh, experience. Like my head felt like it was going to blow off. There were days of suffering. It ruined a trip that I had. So I went back to the doctor and I said, you know, this is not working for me. Do you got anything else? And he said, well, I have some samples of a new drug that just came out. So he gives me that, and it, and it, works, it works amazing. A couple of years go by, I'm paying for this expensive new drug, it's not cheap, and then I switch healthcare providers with jobs, and my doctor denies the prescription. So, of course, I'm kind of pissed. So I go to the doctor, and he says, the stuff that you're taking is just, 
they've messed with the molecule and re-released it on the market, it's not any different than what's on the market already. And I was like, you're totally wrong. I tried all those, it didn't work, this works. You, you gotta write me the prescription. So I, I battled with my doctor for several days, bunch of emails, some phone calls, he made me come in, and then he explained it to me in person, I did some research, and then I found out I was completely wrong. I did some testing and I tried both meds. I used them interchangeably and I could not detect any difference. It, it, was, it was just marketing. They re-released it. They, they moved a molecule one little bit, re-released it on the market. I thought I was getting the special new thing, but it was just the same old drug that's all, all, already been out there. So that leads me to my final point, which is uh, life is like a magic show. So while you watch a magician perform and time after time, they completely fool your five senses. Did it ever occur to you that maybe your perceptions have been completely mistaken about other things you thought you experienced? Except that during the rest of life, unlike a magician show, you don't know you're about to be fooled. So you're not properly skeptical. In fact, the smartest way to go through life is just like sitting in the audience of a magic show. In a magic show, you expect that most of what you see is potentially bullshit just like the internet. And the truth is somewhere <laughs> hidden, like try to read a medical study. And it's only carefully revealed after investigation, exhaustive research, and, and perhaps the truth is never revealed at all. So being skeptical means being able to say, I don't yet have enough data to make a decision. I don't know. Even more profound, consider that magicians are not the only masters of manipulating the human brain. Most of us are bad at math and probability. We assume that certain experiences are rare that aren't rare at all, such as prophetic dreams or coincidental pairings of events or meeting friends in strange places. Priests and spiritual gurus, corporate marketing experts, politicians, and your friend who does tarot card readings are all drawing on a vast literature of techniques which leverage many of the weaknesses that the human brain evolved with. Some of these people don't even know they're using these techniques to warp the flow of experience that enters the observer's mind because they are just doing what works. So just like what a magician does, except the magician you often know is trying to trick you. So given that fact, the worst manipulator of all is potentially us. Human beings have a vast propensity to believe what is comfortable rather than what is true. People vastly overrate their ability to clearly perceive reality. I mean, who has not been in a relationship where they had a false vision of what it was that existed between them and that other person, <laughs> only to have it shattered by reality <laughs> at some later date? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> not that he's bitter. <laughs> Clearly, we're all aware of emotions that can cause us to adjust reality to a perception that is more pleasing to our preferred frame of reference. All of us need some basic training in how error prone the brain's perception engine is. So basically what I'm telling you all is this. You and I, we collectively were full of shit. <laughs> we're giant electro crap magnets. I mean, if, if you want to be a seeker of truth, you must in a sense celebrate admitting you're wrong. If you like being right too much, your emotions are gonna lead you away from the truth. If you celebrate being wrong, it means you are celebrating your own education. So why join a skeptics group? People often join skeptical groups because they are somewhat tired of the religion question. You've heard some of that earlier. And they wonder what is next. A atheism can seem like a lack of a worldview. They don't want to be defined by something they aren't, something they don't believe. Modern scientific skepticism is a worldview, but it doesn't tell you what to think. It is not about dogma. We can and do disagree often. Instead, we try to learn how to think. By learning about neuroscience, psychology, pseudosciences, logical fallacies, and proper ways to evaluate evidence, you kind of upgrade your brain software for parsing reality, and it allows you to come up with more consistent and more practical results. And, and those results, as, as I mentioned in my example, will save you cash and stress and time and effort. So the world is full of these people trying to sell you something. It's religion, it's health food, medical treatments, new laws, 
Skepticism is the only way you are going to vaccinate your brain against these masters of manipulation. Skeptics are okay with provisional truth. And so most skeptics find religion with its absolute truths and dogma to be at best annoying. <laughs> From the skeptical point of view, getting on top of your mountain of truth and screaming about truth with a capital T is just silly. So again, our focus is on the practical. We bring up topics that affect our everyday life, such as food or healthcare and law, and we examine them together. You try to make real life decisions and you you combine resources with other critical thinkers. And so what a skeptic is, what it is to be a skeptic is we are mental martial artists in training, learning how to defend ourselves against us. Thank you and may the force be with you. <laughs> Thanks Storm. I'm not bitter about any of my previous relationships either. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I do think it's wise to trust but verify. Um, just to prove to you all, I heard a male voice say sorry. That's, <laughs> I know it's my demographic, but that's a little frightening. Um, just to prove to you all that, that uh, nobody in this movement has any opinions, um, we're going to unleash on you the next speaker. Um, he is a he is a friend of the uh, local community. He has also been active, uh, uh, particularly in the skeptical community, but in the secular community as a whole nationally for more than twenty five years. He's he's appeared on a lot of television shows. Uh, he is a magician. He is an author. He's a public speaker. Um, he is uh, very deeply involved with James Randi's foundation, JREF. Uh, and the amazing meeting that they produce, uh, I think ever since uh, 2003. Uh, he's been involved with them since before that. So he's a fellow at the James Roundy Foundation. He is one of the people in charge of the million dollar, um, the million dollar challenge that the James R Randy Foundation puts out. If you don't know about that, look it up. It's really cool. Um, I, I could probably uh, read off a list of his, uh, his credentials uh, that would take a long, long time, but I'll just introduce him as our friend, uh, Jamie Ian Swiss. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. A pleasure to be here today. Thanks for inviting me to take part in this. Uh, happy to be here sort of as a representative of the James Randi Educational Foundation, uh, one of the leading skeptic organizations uh, in the country and really in the world today. And as John mentioned, we do the, the Amazing Meeting, which is the largest uh, skeptical conference and critical thinking conference every year in Las Vegas. I highly uh, encourage you to investigate that. It is a great time. Uh, so I'm happy to take part in this. Um, I want to speak to uh, some things about my ideas about what the skeptic mission is that uh, uh, Navik has talked about here, and also some aspects of humanism and atheist activism, and particularly about some of both the differences and the similarities between the skeptic humanist and atheist movements, where we overlap, where we differ. Now, as a skeptical activist for more than 25 years, I've been involved in discussions about the definition of what comprises a skeptic mission, and you can get a really good sense of that if you go online and you look at the mission statements of leading organizations like uh, the JREF, uh, like uh, Michael Shermer's Skeptic Society, uh, also regional organizations. I'm, in, I'm one of the founders of the National Capital Area Skeptics and the New York City Skeptics. We all have mission statements, and it can tell you a lot about what skeptics think we are trying to do in the world. But if I had to summarize or abbreviate all of this, I would echo what Navik has just said, which is that scientific skepticism is about a way of thinking. It is about how to think and not about what to think. So skeptic activists do a number of things. We try to educate the public about science, about critical thinking. We're also interested in the particular importance and dangers of pseudoscientific claims, paranormal claims. We're interested and emphasize the subject of testable claims. That's a big focus of how we distinguish skepticism from some of these other movements, uh, allied movements. And finally, we're also consumer advocates. We're consumer advocates to protect people from the dangers of pseudoscience in the marketplace. You know, there's no, more, no better example than homeopathy, for example, but there are endless examples. So as far as testable claims, uh, we are, 
we, we hold no position. What it really means is, is that skeptics hold no position when it comes to faith, faith-based claims. So if you believe in God based purely on faith, that's not a testable claim. So we have no argument with you. But if you claim that prayer works, that is a testable claim. And that's where the skeptic enters the argument. And this is a workable stance. It's a bit of a kludge philosophically because if someone comes into a skeptic meeting and says they believe in ghosts or UFOs or the Loch Ness Monster purely based on faith alone, and they don't claim to have any claims of epistemological evidence, we probably wouldn't give them a free pass. But you don't really hear that defense of those beliefs by and large. And in fact, I think it's pretty much a fiction that people believe in God purely on faith alone. It misunderstands the complex realities of faith and belief and the nature of how that works. Most people claim they have arrived at those beliefs reasonably, rationally, and that they have evidence. Now, do they have evidence whether that might be the blind watchmaker, that might be their evidence, right? Or the fact of the working eyeball, this is their evidence, right? Um, it's, the world's all too complicated to have been made at random. Well, we as skeptics don't think that's good evidence. But that doesn't mean it's not evidence of some kind. So you have to realize that to someone else, that is evidence. It's just weak evidence by the standards of critical thinking and the scientific method, which are our guiding principles in the skeptic movement. So our challenge as activists is to help explain to people the difference between that kind of evidence and better evidence. I think that's one of the most important jobs that skeptics do in the world. Not about telling people whether they're right or wrong, but how to figure out what is right or wrong. Now, for practical purposes and perhaps even strategic ones in the movement, test testable claims and empiricism are very sound places to pitch your tent if you're in the skeptic movement. And atheism, for me, as a skeptical activist, is not the best ground for skeptics to pitch their tent on. Now, it's not because you might offend people or because religion should be given any sort of special pass. That's a weak position, and I actually think it's an imaginary one. It's one I only seem to hear raised as a straw man that atheist activists accuse skeptics of promoting sometimes. Uh, it's never a real position presented by skeptics that I know of. I can't find any skeptic organization or skeptic thought leader who thinks any subject should be given any sort of free pa pass from open, fair inquiry. Uh, and skepticism is generally promoted within the movement as a thinking toolkit that should and must be broadly applied to every available subject. No sacred cows is what the skeptic society says in their mission statement. But again, the subject of testable claims is the skeptic's home turf. That's really my point. Among the JREF's most visible and successful projects, besides um, the amazing meeting that I just mentioned, is our legendary million dollar challenge. And quite simply, the MDC is literally about testable claims. We offer a million dollar prize for anyone who can demonstrate any paranormal ability under mutually agreed upon test conditions. I'm one of the people who helps administer that prize. Testable claims is a viable, dynamic cause for skeptics because we address testable claims where no one else really does in the marketplace of ideas. And we care in ways that no one else does, and we are uniquely qualified to do that in the skeptic world. So the question of what it means to be a skeptic or what the mission of a skeptics organization comprises, yes, has always been interested to me, interesting to me and to other skeptical activists and organizers. But as the skeptic movement continues to expand in many directions and, in fact, succeed in some ways, the question has become more important than ever within our movement and within aligned movements. Because in some ways, skeptics have become the victims of a kind of success, I think, a success that has led at times to confusion uh, within the skeptic movement and within uh, other allied movements as well. Now, okay, I know it's hard to think of the skeptic movement as much of a success when you look at the numbers and percentages of Americans who believe in psychics and conspiracy theories and homeopathy and anti-vax paranoia and so much other toxic nonsense. But Everything is relative, and show, surveys do show that fewer Americans believe in psychic phenomena today, for example, than they did 20 years ago. In 2009, CBS did a poll uh, that showed about a 7% decline in paranormal claims over a 20-year period. That's a kind of success, and I think skeptical activists can likely claim a hand in that success, and that's good news. Uh, also, the movement has grown wildly in numbers, numbers of individuals, numbers of organizations, numbers of activities and gatherings. By one current count, there are over 200 skeptic-related groups 
in the United States right now, if you include meetups and skeptics in the pub and so on, and that is not including atheists and humanist groups. This is skeptic groups. And that's great. That's very different than 36, 37 years ago when there was only one organization trying to define itself and what was then a fledgling movement. That was PSYCOP, the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims to the Paranormal, which was organized by, by Paul Kurtz uh, and a number of uh, science writers, uh, journalists, and especially magicians. Um, and today, PSYCOP is now known as uh, CSI, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Those folks must not watch, watch much television. <laughs> <laughs> now, when there's just one group, it's easy to keep everybody under the same umbrella, but as a movement grows in size, activists and organizations spend more time refining and often arguing about the more finely tuned differences in focus and opinion and perspective within the movement. And this is where skeptics find ourselves now. Sometime Sometimes to our detriment, it's not a bad thing to have these conversations. We'll always need and continue to have them. And it's great that we're having this discussion to define the sim both similarities and differences and what we're about. But it can be unfortunate to be battling over those conversations, both politically and publicly, which also happens. And I think that to use a magician's term, skeptics have been misdirected in a way by those degrees of success because we've all been very happy and excited to welcome everyone into the club, and for a while we didn't realize there were significant differences between various kinds of folks, all of whom self-identify as skeptics in one way or another. So for example, I think we've been misdirected by the visible growth and success of the so-called new atheist movement. Now, I'm an atheist, as I've said on countless first dates in my, in my life. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not just an atheist, I'm an atheist with an attitude. <laughs> But, 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 I'm not an atheist activist. I'm a skeptical activist. I have nothing against atheist activism. I'm in favor of it. I support it. I'm a strong supporter of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science and of their approach to atheist activism. And as Sean pointed out, that idea, that analogy between the atheist movement and uh, the gay rights movement, the idea of just being out as atheists, forcing people to confront the notion that you are there next to them, mm -hmm. that you are there in their workplace and in their public place and in their neighborhood and in their, in, you know, in their community, and that you're as good a person, maybe better, but good or bad, whatever they think of you, you're there. And that is a terrific model, I think, for the atheist movement. If you want to talk about, you know, every movement suffers from, oh, it's the wrong word. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with <laughs> new skeptic movements, organiz organizations, you know, oh, can't we find a better word than skeptic? Well, you can't find one word that's a perfect word to describe anything. So you take the word that you have and you put it out there and you tell people what it really means and you demonstrate what it really means. We're atheists, get over it. Um, but I'm also not a secular humanist activist. I don't particularly identify as a secular humanist in the capital S and capital H, even though I'm certainly a humanist philosophically. I've attended and presented uh, and performed at humanist gatherings on behalf of the Center for Inquiry and American Humanist Association. I'm actually presenting at the AHA conference that's coming to San Diego this year. I'll be speaking there. Uh, and I'm also speaking at the Orange County Free Thought Conference. Both of those are in May, I think. But I say it again, I'm not an atheist activist. I'm not a humanist activist. I'm a skeptical activist by very deliberate choice. And I want to explain to you for a few moments why that is for myself. So if skepticism is a broad-based way of thinking about claims and trying to figure out what is and is not true, then atheism is simply skepticism applied to a single extraordinary claim. But I'm interested in all of them. Now, we've all heard the statement, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. Well, here's my version for skeptics. Tell a man what to think, feed his head with one idea. Teach him how to think, feed his head with ideas for a lifetime. That's why I'm a skeptical activist. That's why I'm not an atheist activist. I'm not arguing against atheist activism. I'm just talking about why I'm a skeptical activist and why that's different. As skeptics, we're not committed what to think, but how to think. And we don't need to tell other people what to think in order to be accepted as students of critical thinking, which as skeptics is what we all are and what we should be modeling, exactly what Navik was just talking about. I, I mean, that story about getting new evidence and finding out where you were wrong and changing it, it's really hard. Human brains are wired not to do that, yeah. okay? So it's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to, to negate 
your own personal experience and put it aside mm -hmm. and say, and, and instead de decide that your version of truth, what's true in the world, is based on some abstract, distant notion of replicable studies. But actually, that's how you find out what's true in the world. So I have little interest in devoting myself to advocating simply for any one outcome. And I have great interest in advocating for a particular process of thinking. And I have zero interest in any implication there should be any sort of litmus test of conclusions reached that should serve as requirements for entering my skeptic tent. If you're interested in the scientific method and rational means of inquiry, if you're interested in empiricism and what it tells us about the world and the methods of critical thinking as a way to discover more about the world every day of your life, then you're welcome in my skeptical tent. And I don't really care if you bring in some pet kooky idea with you or, on the other hand, if you simply haven't quite gotten all the way down the path yet to atheism. I don't in any way believe or, in su or support that kind of political correctness in the movement. And my reasoning is this now. If someone embraces the basic tenets of critical thinking, of reason and rational inquiry, of the scientific method as a way of determining truths about the natural world and universe, then I do believe that that person is going to make the world a better place. And if they embrace that way of thinking just a little more today than they did yesterday, I believe they're going to make the world a better place today because they're gonna make better decisions, they're going to help others to make better decisions, and that is the only way the human race is going to solve the problems that we are faced with on a planetary, on a global level within our world, and that's the way I want my fellow human beings to contribute to making decisions that affect me, affect my family, my kids, affect all of us, every one of us on the planet. So I want to welcome people who are willing to apply a process of using scientific and critical thinking to reach a conclusion regardless of what they actually happen to believe today. I don't have to agree with all of their conclusions as long as they're willing to embrace that process and they're open to revising right, their conclusions. So while personally I might like to think that embracing scientific skepticism is likely to lead to an eventual embrace of atheism, and the new study that just came out that's really interesting about that, it got some press in the last week or so, right, about, about uh, economic and educational uh, success lowering religious belief is a global trend. Well, I'm, 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 I'm willing to wait for that. I'm willing to bide my time and accept the best of what people have to offer along the path, even if they never get there. As my friend Steve Novella from the Skeptic Guide to the Universe and Science-Based Medicine has written, quote, I prefer to give people critical thinking sk skills and a love for science and not worry about their faith. Now, there's another reason that as skeptical activist, we also need, I believe, to think about these distinctions because the world is full of atheists who are not skeptics. Now, when I was helping to start up the New York City Skeptics, one of our co-founders was involved with a number of atheist meetup groups. And when we were calling our first public gatherings together, this is uh, 2007, uh, I cautioned my skeptical colleagues that while the atheist meetup lists were good places to start to get the word out and attract people to our new skeptic organization, nevertheless, those meetup folks were not necessarily going to comprise a lot of our eventual target demographics. And sure enough, at our first skeptics in the pub, I end up arguing with some woman about the book, The Secret. Right? You know this? Okay, promoted by Oprah Winfrey. Now that book, that book is toxic pseudoscience. Cover to cover. Okay? I'm shocked. It's filled with, well, it's filled with ancient ideas that are very wrong and very bad. That basically, if you think good thoughts, good things are going to happen. Which means that if bad shit happens to you, it's all your freaking fault. <laughs> Now, this woman was an atheist who didn't have the first clue about what I was saying and could see nothing wrong with the book. Years ago, my wife Candace, who's sitting right here, set out to form a rational parenting meetup group here in San Diego, and she decided to call it Atheist Parenting. I, now, I cautioned that it, it might not attract the demographics she was looking for, like-minded parents, like-minded skeptical parents, but at the same time, our boys were just entering school, kindergarten at the time, and they were hearing the word God for the very first time in their lives, thanks to the Pledge of Allegiance, and we were totally freaked out, the parents. And so we were uh, suitably freaked out by that, so we ended up calling it the Atheist Parent Meetup. And at the very first meeting, a woman turns to Candace and says, so, what's your sign? <laughs> <laughs> now, about a year ago, when Debbie helped bring Richard Dawkins 
and uh, Sean Faircloth and, and, uh, and Elizabeth uh, Cornwell Pardon. to uh, speak here in San Diego. So, so one night, we, Candace and I had dinner with, with Richard and them, and, and we're out to dinner, and we're telling them, Candace is telling this story. And when Candace gets to the punchline, Richard's eyes get you know, literally wide, and he says, that did not happen. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yes, it did. You know? How do you say, oh, no, you didn't in a British accent? You know? I can't do it. I wish I, I wish I could do it. So, you, and you know what you get when you find people, when you encounter people who come to skepticism through routes other than scientific skepticism and a scientific worldview? You get Bill fucking Marr. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's a guy who is supposedly an outspoken atheist, although, by the way, if you read the fine print, he's not an atheist. Mm. And some of us love that part, right? But he's also an anti-science, anti-vaxxer, dangerous ignoramus pr promoting toxic anti-pseudoscience that kills people. So this is a place where, as a skeptical activist, I actually disagree with my friend Richard Dawkins. Mm -hmm. He's indicated on stage that he's okay with accepting Bill Maher as an ally because Richard's priority as an activist is to combat religion, which I'm all for it. But I'm not willing to accept that brokered alliance. It's not a minor footnote to me that Bill Maher is anti-vax. It's not just something to me. Yeah. It's everything. He's not an atheist and a kind of weak skeptic. He's an atheist and he's my enemy. He is the enemy of my movement. He is making the world a worse and more dangerous place by promoting anti-science and bad thinking. He's not even close to being my ally. I don't give a damn that he's an atheist. Screw Bill Maher. So, now tell us how you really feel. You never have to ask me that. You have to ask your other friends, but that's one question you don't have to ask me. Okay? It's the default position. Don't worry about it, baby. <laughs> So as a skeptical activist, I welcome believers into the skeptic tent with the proviso that they get no free pass and they must be prepared to be argued with about those beliefs. But I think it's quite possible that the genuine skeptic and critical thinker who happens to believe in God today is probably making my world a better place today than a faith-based atheist who is not really a skeptic. So... What do I think all this means for the skeptic movement and for the discussion of the skeptic mission and for all these ally movements who are represented in this room today? It means this, that skepticism is not atheism, is not secular humanism. Now, I said skeptics got misdirected by success. When the so-called new atheism came along, skeptics were delighted. And why wouldn't we be, right? Many of us are, in fact, atheists. And much of the new atheism was, was science-based atheism. And that it was atheism that grew from and promoted a scientific worldview. Certainly that's the message that Dawkins puts forward. That's the message that Dan Dennett puts forward. And what's more, all these folks identified themselves as skeptics too. Hell yeah, we're skeptics, they declared. Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens both spoke at the amazing meeting, uh, the, Randy, the Randy conference. They became regular speakers, came back every year. Christopher came back every year until his uh, untimely death. Dan Dennett spoke in there. That's how I first met both those gentlemen. Uh, that's three out of four, the so-called four horsemen, right? right? Uh, except for Sam Harris. And uh, atheists particularly seem to share priorities with secular humanists that are deeply committed to issues like church and state separation. Skeptics support this. And the encroachment of religion on education and freedom of speech, creationism versus evolution. I, I think in, in the skeptic movement, most people support all that. What good skeptic doesn't? So there is little question that in the Venn diagram portraying skepticism, atheism, and secular humanism, there is a great deal of overlap. But I would say that these are, to adapt a phrase from Stephen Jay Gould, these are overlapping magisteria. And you can find my extended version of this discussion on YouTube if you like. It's a long talk that I gave at the TAM meeting last year. So I think that for those whose skepticism springs from a scientific worldview, then atheism, humanism, and skepticism are overlapping, non-competing magisteria that should not be in conflict, but they're also not the same things. Mm -hmm. And if anything, I'd suggest that the most unifying, overarching vantage among them is skepticism. Now, that might be my bias. But oddly enough, in my personal experience, skeptics often do possess 
the broadest vision among these three magisteria. I've been at humanist gatherings. I've had countless conversations with people there who've never heard of Randy, never heard of Psychop. And yet many skeptics, I think most in my experience, tend to be reasonably informed at least about the basics of both atheism and secular humanism. For me, all these movements have things in common and share parts of their worldviews, and for many of us, big parts, but the distinctions between them are actually important. Not because they're distinctions we should be battling over, quite the contrary. Rather, they're distinctions we should be clarifying for everyone's comfort and focus and mutual effectiveness, not to draw battle lines between us, but to allow allies to better focus their particular armies on their particularly battlefields in the war, in the war. Same war, different armies, different battlefields, same war. The Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, all fighting on the same side in the same war. So I encourage you all to become informed about skepticism, about the James Randi Educational Foundation at randy.org, about our famous Million Dollar Challenge, about the world's largest annual conference on skepticism and critical thinking, the amazing meeting. Uh, next one's coming up in July. But I also encourage you to align yourself with whatever ground forces you seem most attracted to, most concerned with, most supportive of. Arm yourself with a steady supply of knowledge and growing expertise, and then find like minds to associate with, to lock arms with, to march forward into battle with, and together, let's change the world. Thanks, Jamie.